Several weeks ago when I was working on the sermon for this Sunday, sort of the sermon series for the whole summer, and I saw that this text was that of Joseph reconciling with his brothers, and I knew that as a congregation we were exploring this connection between the book of the Bible and the book of creation, and I wondered how in God's name there was going to be any kind of correction or connection. But then I read, but then I read that story more closely, and I heard not once but twice, twice, Joseph saying to his brothers, hurry, hurry, go get your father, go get our father. It may be too late. Don't dawdle, don't delay, go now. And a few weeks ago, I thought I'd nailed it for today. Because when it comes to thinking about our faith and thinking about our role in the rest of creation and our relationship with the rest of creation, there is absolutely no time to dawdle. There is no more time to deny that what we human beings are doing in this and to this and with this planet Earth, with its temperature, with its air, with its water, with its good soil, all of that, to deny that we are having an impact that will create havoc for future generations, as it is already now in many places of this world. There is no time, there is no time to delay in getting our relationship with the rest of creation back in its right relationship. Just like Joseph knew there was no time for him to continue his anger or continue the brokenness of the relationship with his brothers. And so through his tears, he tells them to hurry, go get their dad. So that was going to be the sermon about two weeks ago. But then this summer has progressed. And last weekend, we saw things that many of us have not seen, either for a long time or before. Things that our African American brothers and sisters and other sisters and brothers of color and those of other traditions other than Christian live with in this country. The rest of us saw it in Charlottesville. And as I considered this sermon for this Sunday, in the wake of all that, I knew that Joseph's story of reconciling with his brothers has that same sense of urgency for us. Because my brothers and sisters, if we do not find a way to reach across those lines of race and class, religion, region, all those things that divide us as a country and as a world, we are not going to make it. We are not going to make it. We have got, we have got to understand the fierce urgency of our time when it comes to racism, when it comes to anti-Semitism, anti-Islam, all those other antis of our time. And just as Joseph reached out across things that would divide him, we have got to do the same as brothers and sisters in this nation and in the whole human family. It may not be obvious on a Sunday morning, especially in the summertime when kids are away, but over half of the children in this congregation are children of color. What happened last week in Charlottesville impacts their lives. And my brothers and sisters, I would also argue, it impacts the lives of the other children in the congregation as well, the ones who are not children of color. What we saw 
what we saw is something that our children are living with and we must respond. It means, my brothers and sisters, we cannot delay any longer and say, well, that happens over there. Or that happens in that community. Or that that happens, um, that, that doesn't concern us. We cannot delay in accepting responsibility. And we cannot delay in getting out of our own comfort zone, whatever that comfort zone might be, and actively and committedly reaching across those boundaries of class and race and religion and all of those things. It is the fierce urgency of now. And I know that that is not easy. It is not easy in a whole variety of ways. Let me give you an example. For me personally, in many ways, I have much more in common theologically, spiritually, emotionally, with people like my good friend, Monsignor Jerome Martinez, a liberal Catholic priest here in Santa Fe, Hispanic. I have much more in common with Monsignor Jerome in the same way I had and was blessed in my life with the Reverend Dr. Reuben Shears, one of the great leaders of the United Church of Christ, who'd grown up in the AME Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and whose understanding of ministry continues to shape mine. I am eternally grateful for such people in my life. Where I really have a challenge is with some of my Protestant Christian brethren and sisters. It keeps coming home to me on a regular basis because, as many of you know, I serve on the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. We're trying to launch a nationwide program bringing together faith communities from across this country of all different types to, to come together around issues of mental health and suicide prevention. I've been at this work, thanks to Pam Hyde, for seven years we are finally launching a national campaign. I co-chair the Faith Communities Task Force, and only in the last four months have the white evangelical Christians begun to partner with us. Some of that has to do with size. If you're, you know, if you're the head of a mega church that has 25,000 people at worship over a given weekend, and then you broadcast to another gazillion people around the globe, you don't want to partner up with a church like the United Church of Santa Fe. I mean, I think we're pretty good, but nonetheless, <laughs> some of it has to do with size, but some of it also has to do just with orientation. And it is sometimes, my brothers and sisters, like pulling teeth to say, no, if we're going to put it out of video, as we have, it can't just have one white face of a male ordained Protestant minister. It's gotta have a bunch of faces and a bunch of voices. That's only one small example. But it has meant for me getting out of my own comfort zone and trying to figure out how do we talk with one another and learn from one another. How do we do that hard work? and to recognize that it is not easy. It is not easy for me, as an ordained woman from a progressive Protestant tradition who values things like interfaith work, multicultural work, multiracial work, who has people in my own life whom I love dearly and who have shaped my life and blessed my life, who do not look like me, do not use the same language of faith, do not have the same skin color. It is very hard to be in the presence of people who are saying to me, we live in a Christian nation. Or be in the presence of people who I know do not approve of not only ordained women, but do not approve of LGBT people or all the other things that would divide us. But the one thing that can unite us 
at times is a commitment to mental health issues. It's hard to stay in that conversation. And I know it is equally hard for them to stay in conversation with me. To work with women who, because of their traditions, have never had the option, have never had the option of being ordained or being recognized for leadership within their own faith tradition, but who have carved out leadership for themselves as women's ministers or as ministers' wives. And that that for them is a bona fide position of leadership. It's hard to be in the presence of someone who has reverend in front of her name. Those are just some very small examples. It's hard for them to be in the presence of someone who consistently says, you know what, we've got to get some other people in here. We need to get voices from the black church. We need to get Jewish voices. We need to get Islam voices. It is hard for them to hear that on a regular basis. But they have and they've hung in. It is the fierce urgency of now, my brothers and sisters, unless we are willing to get out of our comfort zones and have those conversations, even as we stand up for justice, even as we stand up for what we believe is right, but to continually try to reach out across those boundaries. The fierce urgency of now, of this work, and we have our work cut out for us. So the sermon was going to end right then, too. <laughs> but then yesterday morning, hang in there just for another five minutes, OK? <laughs> hang in. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Because it just feels like the time that we're in right now is so, so important to, get, to, to grasp and to wrestle with. So that was, was, that was the sermon as of Friday night. Yesterday morning, I got up very early in the morning, went down to Indian Market. It's something I do, I have done for the last 30 years, ever since I first moved to Santa Fe to become the pastor of the church on Indian Market Sunday um, in 1987. I got up early in the morning 30 years ago. I did it this year, I did it this year too. Get down there before all the crowds come, get down there while they're still setting up, brewing the coffee, getting ready. The, the fry bread isn't even done yet. I mean, that is a real sacrifice. I'm down there, but, I, but for me, growing up in the Southwest, having lived um, on the Navajo Reservation, having, for me, it always is grounding to go down to Indian Market and to hear Tewa and Tiwa and Navajo and Apache and all these other wonderful languages and to see all of the various ways that God is creative through all of these different people. And this time, I was walking by a young man's booth and a painting caught my eye. His name is Jason Valencia. He's 36 years old. He's from San Felipe Pueblo. It's the first time he's ever shown at Indian Market. He's a painter, self-taught. <coughs> Had lots of wonderful nature pictures, whatever. But the picture that caught my eye was this one. Now, it caught my eye partly because we are in the process of expanding our nurture center. <laughs> we broke ground. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, one of these days, we will, have, we will have new space for children here at the church. And one of the reasons this caught my eye was this is a sign of hope for those new spaces. We'll put it up in there. But more so, it caught my eye because it reminded me of what needs to happen before the fierce urgency of the work we're called to do. And that is the urgency of prayer. You can come up and take a look at this afterward, but basically it's a picture of a little Pueblo girl modeled after Jason's own daughter who is in the midst of grinding corn. You can see the matate down in the right-hand corner. She's already filled one basket. She still has another basket of corn to grind. But in the midst of it, she's taken time to raise that one basket up to the heavens and to give thanks, to ask God's blessing on it. Now, quite possibly, she's got older brothers who are saying, come on, get a move on, we're hungry. But in the midst of it, she's saying, thanks be to God for the work, for the corn, for the beauty all around. And so this painting, my brothers and sisters, reminded me of the fierce urgency of prayer, that before we 
take on whatever it is God's calling us to do and to be in this world in this time. To take time to pray. To pray about it. To pray for courage, to pray for strength, to pray for whatever guidance we need. To pray at the beginning and the middle and the end of any work that we do. Whether it's grinding corn, teaching children, trying to be a grandparent, or working for justice. The fierce urgency of prayer. And within the Native American traditions, as within other traditions outside of the United Church of Christ, people actually pray with their whole bodies. They dance, they sing, they walk, they grind corn. Joseph knew the importance of all of that. In his time in prison, he finally came into relationship with the real creator of the stars of the heaven and the sun and the moon. And it wasn't him. It's what gave him the ability finally to reconcile with his brothers. Was that prayer and that relationship with the God who held his life even in prison. Jason Valencia knows that. That's why he created this picture. And I got the picture for this church. For the Nurture Center. So that from the very earliest age, any child and any adult who goes through the doors of the Nurture Center knows what's most urgent. To be in prayer. Prayer for guidance. Prayer for hope. Prayer for strength. Prayer for wisdom. To thank God for who we are and the ways in which God blesses us and to recommit to God those thanks and that blessing. As the mother of Heather Heyer said at her funeral, we can't do it all, but we can take the next step, and we can make a difference. And my brothers and sisters, a place to start on that journey is to know the fierce urgency of prayer for every single step of the way. Thanks be to God.